In this episode of The Reading Room, I interview an award-winning Hull poet. She's got an ongoing literary project, publishing a slim volume of 15 poems on a single subject every year. She's also an Estuary TV favourite, who I'm sure regular viewers are going to recognise. I'm here with a poet and writer, Audrey Dunn. Now, you are described as a poet and a writer, and the thing that came into my mind was, is there a difference between being a poet and being a writer? Well, I sometimes wonder myself, but I do like sometimes to do prose and, um, and, I'm, and, and essays. I, I, I belong to the whole Women's Literary Club, so now and again I, provide, I produce an essay. I, I also like writing letters and nowadays emails, but um, things like that. So I do do a lot of prose writing. Um, my, my creative writing is a very poetic style, but I did do a book um, in the late 90s called um, The Stage in My Life, and that was put out by Hutton Press, and that's, that's a story. Yeah. It's an autobiographical account of my life at that time. So when you're writing prose, and especially factual prose, does it feel like a different process? Well, it, writing's always magical and you, you don't know where the words come from. They kind of form themselves in your head out of the air. So there's always a magical process in writing. But um, in poetry, that is more so. In poetry, I kind of wait for the lines to appear. I don't rush them through. Um, or, or sometimes I've, I've advocated speed writing for, for poetry and that can be a good way but these days I kind of wait on the words and the idea so that there is a difference and of course in, in, write, in poetry a poem is like a, a very short story it's, it's like a complete thing and it has very strong imagery and uh, is of a different style to, to prose. And I like to think of myself primarily as a poet. So you're a poet that also writes rather than a writer yes. that has a set of poetical... But I can turn my work. hand to all sorts of forms of writing. And in the early days when I was writing, you know, you're finding out what sort of a writer you are. But poetry is, is my, my forte, you might say. In, in terms of engaging with the wider world as a writer, uh, Wordspin that you did with, or you do with Alec Gill. I do. That's a very socially engaged uh, type of work with writing. Are you a socially engaged writer or are you a socially engaged poet? Well, I like to be socially engaged and I do like my work to be accessible. And that's why if I'm doing a poetry reading or anything, I do believe some people say, some poets say, that a poem should stand on its own. But I don't think it does. I think people do appreciate context. And I like to reach people with what I'm writing, although some of my poems are a bit obscure. Poetry does is obscure, and um, if you're reading T.S. Eliot or something, you you know the way into a poem is sometimes to find a line, a couple of lines that really grab you, and you think, what a marvelous image, and sort of work out from there because they are sometimes a bit difficult to understand. But the word spin came from uh, when I taught creative writing. At one time, I taught poetry classes and creative writing classes and did quite a lot in the city. And, um, and with Alec, we, we hired a van. Uh, there was something called, uh, there was a Northumberland Avenue Arts Centre. I remember it well, yes. Do I've been, you? I've been there it was, several times. It was several very great good. Events, yeah. And it was the brainchild of a lady called Pamela Della, who's, who's well and truly uh, passed away now. I, I did workshops there at Northumberland Avenue, some weekends of workshops. And we decided to take a van out on the road. And Alec and I had a buzz session looking for a title for ourselves and uh, came up with Wordspin. And the logo is a, a wheel. And we had some fun. We took it to the pier and we took it across the river and got people writing. One man in particular, um, now then, uh, Mr Young, he, uh, he, he did his memoirs called Young at Heart. And he went a long way with that. He was elderly. And uh, so we had a fun. And then we started to... Um, 
produce, if we work together, Alec and I, which we did sometimes, we did some memory, uh, uh, remembrance. Yes, in fact, I've read the, I've read the book. Yes, yes. workshops. So one, our very first one has recently been used at the Ferrans uh, in the uh, First World War memorabilia exhibition. And uh, so that very first uh, book that we published together that sprang from that very successful uh, workshop with the elderly in Bridlington, um, we called ourselves Wordspin and we've continued to use that for small publishing uh, experiments and uh, we did several with the elderly. Whenever somebody says I teach creative writing, in my case music, Something that I always want to ask, not just other teachers, but I ask myself constantly is, can you teach a creative process? In a way, it's got to be in there. But on the other hand, sometimes you can bring it out. Yes, you can make a place to bring it out and people find they can write when they didn't think they could. And, and the Bridlington workshops were a case in point. We had great fun with that. And people said, I can't write, you know. And we got everyone writing. And that was a fun thing to do. Creating creative writing workshops. I did some at Hull Truck many years ago, well before it moved. And uh, some at... Um, uh, the university, and, uh, but some of my most successful ones I thought were in adult education and we had great fun there uh, in creating a book out of a class and we, we devised all sorts of, ex I devised various exercises and all sorts of things we could do and people were always surprised with what they produced. Of course, sometimes you've got people who came to those classes who thought, now, shall I go to microwave cooking or shall I go to creative writing? <laughs> So their hearts weren't always fully in it, but they were mostly surprised at what they did produce and found it a very interesting thing to do. It's always, I think, gives confidence to students of any kind of creative process. If you've got a teacher that has some sort of kudos and some sort of reputation. And I remember the last time you, I saw you reciting some poetry, it was actually for the launch of one of these books we're going to talk about in a minute. You said that you'd run a poetry prize. Recently. I did. Yes, yes I Tell did. Tell us a bit about that. Now. Well, I went to a poetry reading. I tried poetry prizes off and on. And um, I, I went to a poetry reading at the university and uh, a very good poet who was a woman poet who was up for the uh, poet laureate ship. Uh, and was one of the people that I think was considered at the time was Yue Fanthorpe, U Ursula Fanthorpe. And there weren't all that many, you know, when po poets go to, po to read, sometimes they just have a handful of people. Yeah, there. I've been to a poetry reading. To be fair, there was a reasonable number of poets. There were six of them, six. but they did outnumber the audience. <laughs> happens yeah. doesn't it because people are a bit scared of poetry I think but um, uh, yes uh, you see she was about my age UO Fanthorpe and afterwards I was sat on the front row and she came over to talk to me and I said it's so difficult to get poetry out there you know and she said well why don't you try the competitions well, I said, I've tried a few. Well, she said, your name gets known. You see, one of the things is to get your name known. And uh, uh, so I tried a few competitions and I won, I won that yeah. one. It was a special prize, the Bill Winter Award at Bequest. And um, there was no money in it, I might say. It was a plaque. Yeah. I have a plaque, a bronze plaque at home yeah. to say but you that have, you have recognition and I think that's something Yes, beautiful. that was very nice and it was in Italy. It was lovely, oh, yeah, that's beautiful nice then, yes. autumn in Italy, just north of um, Milan. Yeah. And um, it was uh, it was great fun to do and there was a hill above the city and uh, you, we went uh, all toured it round and each poet had a little chapel to wow. read in. It, was you know it had oh, sort of wonderful. the stations of the cross on the hill and each station was a little chapel yeah. so uh, it was very very beautiful 
Join us in part two as we discuss more about poetry, social engagement, and how the poet finds new forms and themes to explore. The project that you're doing at the moment, which I find fascinating, is the self-published, or they are self-published, but the, the slim volumes of poetry. And I love the phrase, slim volume of poetry. Oh, that's very nice. Yes. I haven't used that Have one. you not? They, no, I, think, I shall I know use you describe them as a pamphlet. And I like pamphlet. I like the idea of being a pamphleteer as well. Yes. But I do like that. I do like, there's something about a slim volume of poetry that, that stands... I think that is better. I shall alone. use right. that, if you don't Maybe. mind, Darren. I'm more more than welcome. <laughs> I think it's a good yes. one to put around, don't you? Uh, and the two that you've published so far is Humberlands and Sealed with a Love and Kiss. And if I'm right, the idea is that you yearly pub are publishing 15 poems mm. around a specific subject or yes. set of yes. set of subjects. Now, the first thing is, I know in the past when everybody, anybody ever mentioned self-publishing, the thing that came to mind was vanity publishing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, these don't seem anything like that. And these days, self-publishing is something that is... M you can achieve a lot more by self-publishing. It's yes. not a case of basically someone yes. charges you a thousand pounds to get your poems published or your book published. Yeah. People are doing it as a genuine alternative to yes. going to a publisher's. How successful has this been as a publishing exercise? Well, I see it as a project. And I got this idea from um, talking to a, a poet and short story writer friend and um, uh, that Dylan Thomas had done early pamphlets. But you find even Philip Larkin's first book was kind of sponsored. Um, yeah, he was a halfway... He wasn't vanity publishing, but he was a... He had, it was a hands-on experience yeah. for him. Yes. He had all the toing and froing. Yes, it was a very a, a publishing house that yes. was very tiny by comparison. Very, to very tiny yeah. and very local. Yes. And it certainly put him on the map as a mm. poet. But uh, um, you can find any number of poets who've had short pamphlets, and mostly it's been yeah. either a small publishing company and something they've been closely involved with. And uh, there, there are a number of small publishers. They've been the Minhull who, mm. you know, would take on your poems and such like. And we still have now some excellent and well-regarded small Oh, Poetical publishing houses, Blood oh, Act's been absolutely. one of them. absolutely, and local ones are very important, you know. I and went to the launch of Seal with a Loving, a Loving Kiss and it seemed extremely well attended. It did, didn't yeah. it? Yes. Well, um, I'm fortunate uh, in having Alec Gill as my partner and he is very good on getting your publicity out. And but I you had, had a fan club there as well. I had a fan club, yes. And, yes. and, the, and it did really feel like you had a set of fans it, in the audience. Yes. Well, you do, you do get uh, a few people who know you've been around and on the scene for a long time. And I, have, I did have a, a book published by Hutton Press called um, The Stage in My Life, which was about uh, my early days after my divorce surviving as a theatre landlady and uh, and so people knew me for that that was um, recorded on Radio Humberside in 15 episodes and I read them myself so I've been about in the city yeah. as a writer for a long yeah. time and I did contact a lot of friends and uh, Alec put me on Facebook and um, you do if it's quite hard work if you do a self-publishing uh, volume because it won't go anywhere unless you get busy making sure people know it's there. You've got to really work quite hard at that. And um, Alec did, uh, well, he presses me to it. He keeps me at it, yeah. you see. So we always did. When we worked together, we always got our books yeah. out. So it's gradually developed between us that we expect to have to work at it and make sure. And these days, you know, we have Facebook and we have our emails and, and um, so the word gets around. My literary club always supports yes. me and, uh, and really respects my efforts in, in, in this um, process, or as I call it, um, 
a project. I see it as a project, yeah. you see. And I have done it before. I did it um, in the 80s. I did a, a similar project, but not so intensively. And I've gained a lot of experience. Yeah. And it then. is a really interesting project, especially as a poetic exercise. It Larkin, who's not always great at explaining his creative processes. No. Uh, I mean, almost made a po point of not explaining his processes. Yes. But the, one of the few things that he did say, and I think it was very incisive, it was about fi finding or coming across a poetic moment or a poetic emotion. And then that was what was created, what created the poem, ultimately the spark. And a lot of poet, poets seem to wait for kind of inspiration to create the poems. But you're setting yourself a task of 15 poems in a year about a specific subject or a range of subjects. How does that affect your creative process? Ah, oh, well, some of the poems I've had a long time. Right. I've always written about the river. I've always been influenced by the Humber. I've always been influenced by the fact that many of our city, many people have been connected to the sea. In fact, my own father was a merchant seaman. Alex's father was a merchant seaman. Yes, yes. So there have always been connections, and I feel that runs in my blood, you see. So that's always. And sometimes I've gone to the, to the pier or, or up to the Humber Bank, and I go there and scribble and see what comes sometime. Um, I might have a vague idea in my head. Um, but I, I do understand uh, what Philip Larkin means. And I, I'm, I'm researching a paper for the Literary Club on Simone de Beauvoir, the French philosopher. And I came across, I was reading some of um, Sartre's letters to her. And uh, he's in the army uh, on the, the border of France and Germany, uh, defending that particular area. And um, he said, he sometimes says, oh, it's poetic. Something happens that seems poetic. And, and I think the poet sometimes sees that poetic moment and sees that there's poetry in a particular scene or a particular action or a particular person. I know I was working on a poem about, um, uh, about um, John the Baptist. I wanted to do some religious poems. I wanted to follow in the steps of Boris Pasternak and Anna Akhmatova, uh, Russian poets I greatly admire. And I wanted to do some religious poems. I've only, I, I've only done half a dozen. I don't think I can get 15 together. You see, you have to be able to gather them up. You're not writing new ones all the time. And I, I started this poem about John the Baptist because I had this particular idea that occurred to me about just before, uh, w yes, just before he goes into prison and has his head chopped off. Um, uh, you know, uh, he meets with Christ on the edge of Galilee and, and he says, are you really the Christ? And Jesus says, well, all these things are happening. And it seems as if Neither of them quite know. And nobody had explored that idea, so I wanted to explore it. And I went to McCoy's Cafe, which uh, is a place I like, and um, a girl came in, and she was um, Salome. Salome. Salome, that's it. This girl was Salome. And I couldn't take my eyes off her. And I, I got the whole middle of the poem right. from seeing yeah. her. So it's like having a poetic yes. moment as such. And there's said. a bit of synchronicity or a bit of uh, yes. serendipity a bit that of you serendipity. happen to be writing the poem and then the poetics, part of the poetic subject matter. Sees it. S yes. It is most amazing. Now, I was having a reread of both volumes uh, this week and I was reading, is it Swans at Barrow Haven? Yes. And what popped into my head was Wild Swans at Cooley. Yes. And what I was thinking, and I, I love both poems, but what I was thinking was as a poet, when you're ad addressing subject matter that you know is already within 
the poetic tradition and you know other poets are writing about it and you know landscapes uh sense of place love are all things that are constantly being covered by other poets yes how do you have the confidence to know that what you're doing is fresh and not to be sometimes even oppressed by the the weight of what's gone before of what's gone before well i don't mind what's gone before um, I did a degree as a mature student at Hull University in English and um, one of my lecturers, I remember, said we're all, we're all little people sitting on the shoulders of giants, mm. really. So that, um, thank goodness for the influence and the poets we love and I, I do love Yeats mm. and I knew it was a bit cheeky but I thought why shouldn't we? have the swans of Barrow Haven. If people want to make that link with Yeats because of the swans of Cool Park, or is it at Cool Park? Um, all right, I don't mind if they make that link. And my next um, book, I, I'm borrowing from Yeats again. Mm because these people are a great influence on us and I don't think it matters if we kind of occasionally echo a little something that's settled in our minds from them. And um, he, did, he did a, seri a short story, a short series, I think, if I remember rightly, called Down in the Sally Gardens, which are in Dublin, I do believe. I haven't been there, but if I go to Dublin, I shall. And next year, I'm, I'm taking um, a leaf out of his book and I'm doing autumn walks in Queen's Gardens because why shouldn't we have yeah. Queen's Gardens commemorated in poetry? And should those poems become famous, which of course, you know, we, fame is the spur, we always yeah. hope that they will be liked by many people and speak to many people, then um, why shouldn't Queen's Gardens be, resonate with that kind of idea? But again, and I've borrowed as well from, for the next one, I don't want to sound too highbrow for my, my readers, but I've borrowed from the Japanese poet Matsuo Basho on haiku. And I'm doing a sort of, thing of prose and poetry in the next one and I'm well on with that. Are the haikus very formulaic in No. That they're, are they, are they, are they they're closer my, to my, right. my answer to right. So you're to not that going form. for the 17 syllable, the, no. more, so closer to maybe no. imagist poetry then? Yeah, that's right, yeah. um, HD, did you ever come across her? Hilda Doolittle, yes. she called herself HD. She, well, she's, she's a great mentor of mine as well. You see, these people are mentors, aren't they? Yeah. Like you read them and read them and you think, I just love the mystery of those short words ending on a, a cliff, a cliff edge, a chasm, yeah. they're going to fall down. So I've, I, I've worked that out, but in my own style. Well, Audrey, hopefully when the book comes out, We'll be seeing you again and talking just about the new book. Yes. yes. So thank you very much for joining us here on The Reading Not Room. Not at all. It's been a delight. Thank you very much, Darren. In this series, we've undoubtedly proved that The Reading's got a plethora of writing talent and that we can welcome writers with an international reputation. I really hope you've enjoyed these conversations as much as I have, and I look forward to seeing you once again in The Reading Room. Mm -hmm.